Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror TV series named The Strain Season 4. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins in New York following the nuclear explosion, where the challenges facing the survivors were severe. Debris from the nuclear explosion filled the atmosphere, blocking sunlight and plunging the earth into a perpetual twilight. This environment was perfect for the blood-sucking vampire race who thrived in the darkness. The vampire plague had expanded to other states. Nine months later, the former CDC doctor Ephraim finds himself in Philadelphia eking out an existence. He obtains his daily necessities through the black market. One day, Ephraim runs out of gas for his small canister and must venture out to purchase more. He takes a shortcut through a forbidden area, wearing an armband on his arm to avoid revealing his identity. He blends into the crowd where ordinary people are lining up for supplies, guarded by armed sentries and patrolling vampires and bloodsucker scouts. Suddenly, a scout lets out a howl, and vampires on the street leap into action, rushing towards Ephraim's direction. He quickly stands against a wall with others, ready to fight back. But someone else charges out before him and is immediately killed by a vampire. Realizing his identity hasn't been exposed, Ephraim takes advantage of the chaos and slips away. He finds himself in Philadelphia's Trade Center, an organization built by Palmer under the Bloodmaster's command and renamed The Partnership. As long as people donate blood regularly, they are granted access and can work there, receiving free food supplies and medical insurance. However, a new class system emerges, dividing people based on their blood type. Individuals with type B positive blood, favored by the bloodsuckers, receive special treatment. They are not only well fed and cared for, but also subject to strict reproduction control. In essence, they are treated like livestock, raised to be slaughtered and bled when the time is right. Ephraim stumbles upon a water truck, initially believing it to be carrying water. But upon closer inspection, he discovers blood residue in the water hose. He later visits the black market, where people who refuse to submit to the blood master's rule trade goods and resources. They also accept commissioned tasks, and Ephraim takes on a job to deliver medicine and alcohol to satisfy his own cravings. He leaves his gas canister with the shop owner to be refilled and heads to the client's house to deliver the medicine. The clients are a middle-aged couple, a cautious husband with a gun and a frail wife lying on a sofa. After diagnosing her with scurvy due to low vitamin C intake, Ephraim learns that the earth is no longer suitable for growing fresh fruits and vegetables, which have become luxury items. Only the partnership still cultivates them in greenhouses, leaving ordinary people unable to afford such food. Instead, they rely on food rations provided at the trade center. These rations are of poor quality and potentially unhygienic. Ephraim advises the couple not to worry, as the food rations still contain vitamin C. He leaves them with medicine and takes his payment, before heading back to collect his gas canister. With alcohol and the food to cook, Ephraim's spirits lift, but danger soon follows. The Bloodmaster discovers the black market location, and a large force is sent to capture its members. The resistant humans are no match for their captors. In less than a minute, they are disarmed and taken away. The shop owner, unwilling to go down without a fight, engages in combat with the infected. But during the struggle, an explosion occurs, causing a truck to flip over and throw Ephraim out. Ephraim survives unscathed, but everyone else in the truck perishes. At the scene, he encounters a stranger with a leg injury caused by the accident, unable to walk. The man begs Ephraim for help, and Ephraim moves him to a nearby location. Just as Ephraim is about to leave after administering first aid, a gun is pointed at his head. It turns out to be the injured man's sister, Alex. Both of them are members of a resistance organization, unhappy with the rule of the Bloodmaster. They plant bombs on the roadside to target buses carrying the infected. Ephraim thinks their actions are too reckless, causing more damage to themselves than to the enemy. However, with the district soon to be locked down, he has no choice but to escape with the siblings. Along the way, he performs a makeshift surgery on the man and asks for some food and gear in exchange. Alex has no doctor friends, so she agrees to a deal proposed by Ephraim. Meanwhile, as human life becomes increasingly difficult, Zack, who is responsible for the nuclear explosion, is playing games. The Bloodmaster has spared no effort to raise this troublemaker. Not only is the blood supply served to the boy constantly, but he also has Thomas give Zack a rifle for fun. The Bloodmaster then takes people to Central Park, letting Zack hunt to his heart's content in the zoo. Though Zack has never touched a gun before, he isn't afraid of doing bad things. He searches for targets, and when he's spotted by a tiger near a cage, he doesn't panic and instead brings down the tiger with a few shots, which much satisfies Zack. In this way, the Bloodmaster wants Zack to experience the power of dominating weaker lives, thus bringing out his dark side. 
To enhance the effect, he even creates an illusion for Zack, encouraging him in the form of his mother Kelly and telling him he's doing a great job. However, Thomas doesn't think highly of Zack and believes the Bloodmaster is too biased. As a loyal servant, Thomas has never seen his master so devoted, and bluntly says that Zack lacks the talent to take on important tasks. But the Bloodmaster just wants to train Zack to become a customized vessel for him, and now, with a hostage in hand, Ephraim would become their ally, preventing Quinlan and Abraham from going after him. This reason strikes a chord with Thomas, who asks why he isn't worthy of being the master's vessel. The Bloodmaster doesn't want to create a rift with his loyal servant, so he takes a step back and promises that if they can catch Abraham and the others, he can abandon Zack as a pawn. Meanwhile, Abraham entrusts Fett and Quinlan to look for nuclear weapons. The two are wandering in North Dakota, which has also been invaded by the vampire strain. One day, Fett takes a woman named Charlotte to a local farm for trade negotiations. Charlotte is a native of the area, acting as Fett's guide and helping him gather information on the location of missile bases. Unfortunately, the farmer doesn't take them seriously. Noticing their lack of possessions, the farmer plans to kill Fett and take Charlotte by force. However, his henchmen are quickly taken down by Quinlan, and the farmer himself becomes a prisoner. Soon, several cars arrive at the farm, carrying a group of strong men armed with weapons who are on Fett's side. They help themselves to the farm supplies without paying a cent. However, Fett is somewhat disheartened by their endless search for nuclear missiles, thinking they might not even exist and that he's just wasting his time. After spending a smelly night in a car with Charlotte, he wakes up to find her gone and rushes out to search for her sexy body. He finds Abraham sitting in a field, holding the ancient book. The two praise each other, believing they hold the key to saving the world. However, they still need to find the face of God. Fett is puzzled by the conversation, and when he realizes what's happening, he finds that Abraham has been transformed and is trying to attack him with a tendril. Fett is terrified and wakes up, realizing it was all just a dream, but the dream reignites his determination to continue his search. The next day, he and Charlotte ride a motorcycle, pretending to be unarmed in order to gather information. However, as they arrive at a cornfield and start breaking corn to eat, they are attacked and taken to a nearby farm. Charlotte finds out that their attackers are all women. She isn't hurt and is treated as a friend. Fett, on the other hand, is in a worse situation, with his hands shackled and locked in a warehouse, blood oozing from the back of his head. However, he has a roommate named Roman, who seems to have been there for quite some time, leisurely lying on the floor reading a book. Fett is still a bit dazed, but manages to get information from Roman, learning that their captors intend to use him as a slave for hard labor. The man wears a government uniform and claims to have a well-supplied hideout with water, electricity, and ammunition. Fett suspects he works at a missile silo and, after further questioning, confirms that it's nearby and hasn't received any launch orders. The nuclear warhead might still be there, so Fett negotiates with the man to reveal the location of the missile silo in exchange for helping him escape. So Fett pretends to be unconscious, and the man calls for help. The kidnappers are easily tricked, not only falling under Fett's control, but also having their weapons taken by Charlotte. The kidnappers have to hand over the key to the shackles. Meanwhile, Quinlan follows Fett's scent and arrives just in time to join him in locating the missile silo. At this point, Abraham and Dutch have been captured for three months. Three months ago, they were hiding out in New York, trading with local gangs for food. One such gang was led by an old acquaintance, Gus. He hadn't left New York, but had formed his own gang, partnering with the book dealer Cream to trade resources. After the nuclear explosion, Cream lost his entire fortune he got from trading the ancient book and had to rely on stealing and scamming to support his followers. Abraham despised Cream's business-minded nature, but admired Gus's combat experience, hoping he would join their side. But Gus firmly refused, leaving Abraham feeling regretful. On their way back, as Abraham was complaining to Dutch, they discovered a group of infected individuals searching their building. All the humans inside had been captured. Dutch urged Abraham to leave quickly, but he was worried about the ancient book he had left inside. With no other choice, Dutch risked retrieving the book while asking Abraham to wait for her by the river. Inside the building, a fire had broken out, filling the hallways with smoke. Dutch managed to get the book, but was discovered by patrolling infected individuals. She quickly evaded her pursuers and hid the book. She then headed to the river to meet Abraham, only to find a group of infected individuals waiting to ambush her. In the end, Dutch was captured and found herself on a truck with Abraham, both now prisoners. At this point, Abraham became disillusioned with humanity, feeling that good things always slipped away too easily. 
In reality, he was reminded of his time in concentration camps, as the Nazis had also transported people in train cars. When Abraham and Dutch got off the truck, they discovered that the vampire's management was strikingly similar to the Nazis, with barbed wire and armed guards everywhere. There was even a scout sniffing at women. Abraham wanted to save them but was knocked out by the infected and taken away. Dutch was led inside through a different door. She didn't know what had happened to Abraham, but being a woman and having B-positive blood, she wasn't mistreated and was well-fed. However, her life was far from easy, as she was locked up in a medical center run by the partnership, reduced to a mere breeding tool. To ensure the purity of the next generation's bloodline, they used artificial insemination. Dutch had yet to get pregnant, and over the past three months, she had tried various escape plans. She even slept with a staff member responsible for transporting sperm, hoping he would smuggle her out in an empty sperm storage container. However, the cowardly staff member backed out on the eve of their plan, fearing for his life if their affair was exposed. While Dutch was chatting with the staff member, a pregnant woman burst into the room, claiming her friend had tried to get pregnant five times without success, and now she had disappeared. The pregnant woman demanded an explanation from the manager, causing a commotion in the hall. The manager was the exact businessman Sanjay, who had a team of medical staff under his command. Seeing that the doctor couldn't resolve the conflict, but Dutch calmed the pregnant woman down with a few words. Sanjay was impressed with her ability and wanted to recruit her. Dutch disdainfully refused his offer, but Sanjay didn't give up, giving her time to reconsider. That night, Dutch went about her usual activities, but while she was in the bathroom, she heard a girl crying in hiding. It turned out the girl had suffered a miscarriage, her second one. She knew that her regular checkup the following week would expose her secret, and if Sanjay found out, she would be sent away. The girl couldn't stop crying at the thought of her uncertain future. Dutch wanted to help her, so she took her to the staff member responsible for transporting sperm, offering the girl the chance she had previously secured for herself. However, the staff member was already panicking, and the girl couldn't bear the thin air in the refrigerator, refusing to stay inside. Their arguing attracted the attention of the guards and doctors. The staff member quickly explained that he hadn't touched them, but Dutch and the girl didn't back him up. The staff member was taken away as expected, and the other two were called in for questioning by Sanjay. Meanwhile, Gus sought more resources by connecting with his cousin, who worked for the partnership. His cousin participated in food production and regularly donated blood, holding a pass that allowed him to move freely in and out of the center. Since their families had a good relationship, the cousin agreed to help Gus steal from the trade center. That night, their group set off, with Gus taking care of the patrolling guards before letting his cousin open the door. They located the warehouse storing the goods, but as they were moving the items, they were discovered by the warehouse manager. The manager had to support his family with the job provided by the partnership. No matter how Gus tried to persuade him, he insisted on reporting the incident. Cream decided to kill him to eliminate the threat. But due to unfamiliarity with the terrain, they let the manager escape and the warehouse alarm was triggered. The group had no choice but to leave in a hurry. After this incident, Gus's cousin couldn't return to work and was taken back to the gang's headquarters. However, Cream didn't want to support another person and told Gus to send his cousin away the next day. Gus insisted on keeping him, leading to an argument between the two. Elsewhere, Ephraim was still taking care of the wounded. Seeing that their wounds hadn't become infected, Ephraim planned to leave with supplies and equipment. However, as he was loading up, a group of resistance fighters burst in. They had planted bombs on the streets at night to provoke the vampires. They were attacked the moment the bomb exploded, and one of their comrades was captured and drained of blood. This made Ephraim more cautious. Once the captured comrade was turned into a vampire, the Bloodmaster would be able to access all of his memories, revealing the Resistance's hiding places. So Ephraim decided to have Alex take everyone and flee. However, the captured comrade was a core member of the organization and knew the locations of all the safe houses. Alex and her group had nowhere to hide. With no other option, Ephraim had to help them by providing a hiding place and setting up an ambush with the remaining bombs. When the infected individuals rushed into the room, he detonated the explosives and finished off any stragglers at the door. It wasn't until nightfall that they reached the hiding place Ephraim had mentioned, a high school in Philadelphia. Ephraim had stayed there before but had moved to a new location due to a lack of supplies. Alex was grateful for Ephraim's help and tried to persuade him to stay and fight the vampires together. But Ephraim had no interest in staying and didn't approve of Alex's approach. 
Although they wanted to rally the public and show that the vampires weren't invincible, planting bombs on the streets was simply too foolish. But as Ephraim argued with Alex, he thought of a new plan. Since the vampires transported entire crates of blood by water truck, they could poison the blood and be able to kill thousands of infected individuals. Ephraim and Alex decide to target the blood transport trucks. After making up their minds, they start concocting poison at the high school. However, without special materials, they resort to using rat poison. Once the poison is ready, the next step is to administer it. Alex's brother wants to hijack a blood transport truck and poison the blood inside before driving the truck into the vampire's lair. Ephraim worries this approach will draw attention since the vampire is now smarter and conducts more checks. After some thought, they decide to stage an accident. They find the blood truck's route and block the road with two cars pretending to have an accident at an intersection. While the drivers argue, Ephraim and Alex's truck emerges from a corner and stops right behind the blood truck. They use a hose to pump the poison into the truck. There aren't many guards along the route, so the operation goes smoothly. Everyone leaves quickly after the poisoning, but they need to observe the results. They secretly follow the blood truck and find a vampire lair. There is no movement inside after the blood truck leaves. Ephraim decides to take a risk and enters the lair to investigate the reason. Alex and her brother reluctantly accompany him into the lair, which is dark and filled with the stench of excrement. They wave their flashlights around, but there are no vampires wandering the hallways, so they proceed unobstructed. They find the troughs and see the dead bloodworms in the depths, as well as many infected individuals who have fallen and can't get up. Even though some of the infected can still attack, their combat abilities are significantly weakened, and they are easily defeated. Upon discovering this, the Bloodmaster is concerned and summons Thomas to discuss countermeasures. Unexpectedly, Thomas sees this as a good thing. After the nuclear explosion, he searched for Abraham's group for several months but found nothing. He was troubled by this, but now that their whereabouts are exposed, he can eliminate them. However, apart from the large number of deaths, the Bloodmaster was also worried about the troublemaker, Zack. Last time, Zack had killed the tiger. To reward his progress, the Bloodmaster assigned a young girl, Abby, to clean Zack's room regularly. Having not spoken to a living person for several months, Zack couldn't help but be attracted to the pretty girl. When she saw fruit on the table while cleaning the room, she couldn't resist stealing too. But she was discovered by a hidden scout, who frightened her into dropping the fruit and calling for help. She declared herself unfit for the job and resigned from her position. Zack chased after Abby, eventually finding her on the street. He assured her that he had no ill intentions and even gifted her the fruit as a present, telling her that she could have as much as she wanted in the future. When Zack invited her to visit the Natural History Museum together, Abby agreed. Seizing the opportunity, she told Zack that she had lost her parents in the first nuclear explosion. Now an orphan, she lived with a group of similarly unfortunate sisters. Due to their unhealthy food, most of them had fallen ill, so she wanted Zack to share his food. Zack readily agreed. He excitedly went to find the Bloodmaster, deciding not to take the white blood any longer and not be a pawn in their schemes. He wanted to save people and help his own kind. The Bloodmaster had to brainwash him, saying that he had lived for thousands of years and that humans were the most dangerous creatures he had ever seen. They were capable of killing each other out of selfishness and would eventually bring about their own destruction. Only the vampire could change history. However, he respected Zack's choice, and if Zack wanted to be an ordinary boy, he could. But then he wouldn't be able to live in the hotel or enjoy endless food, and Abby would lose her job. Under the threats, Zack could only choose to submit and continue being the Bloodmaster's obedient child. At this time, Fett was setting up a tent in the snowy wilderness. Roman had mentioned that the missile silo was very secretive, and to prevent attacks from outsiders, there was no specific route on the map. The journey depended entirely on Roman's directions. It's then revealed that after Zack had detonated the nuclear bomb at the Statue of Liberty, humans had fought several battles with the vampire, but all had ended in failure. Frequent nuclear wars had completely changed the Earth's ecology and brought about the eternal night suitable for the vampire's survival. The next day, Fett and his group set out again, and after much hardship, they finally found the silo. However, several corpses were lying at the entrance, including both the infected and humans in military uniforms. A fierce battle had evidently taken place here. Thomas had arrived first, but he might not have taken the nuclear missile. Fearing an ambush below, Fett threw a few silver powder bombs to test the path. 
Seeing no immediate danger, Quinlan approached the entrance to assess the situation. A sudden gunshot hit Quinlan's thigh, causing him to lose his balance and fall in. His life was not in danger, but no one had anticipated a sniper waiting below. It was difficult to determine friend from foe, and despite multiple attempts to negotiate, there was no response. Fett was worried about Quinlan's injuries, so he wanted to go down and save him. Fett initially wanted to bring more people with him, but his collaborators were afraid of death. Roman could not risk going either, as he was the only one who knew how to separate the warhead and use it. After some discussion, Fett decided to take the risk alone. Meanwhile, Quinlan treated his wounds below and looked for an opportunity to turn the tide. Once Fett entered the tunnel, he realized the sniper was a human. The sniper was caught in a pincer attack, having to guard against Quinlan while facing Fett. He accidentally exposed a weakness, getting shot in the shoulder by Fett. Then, Quinlan finished him off with one shot. After overcoming the defenses, they easily obtained the nuclear warhead. However, Roman pointed out that the core assembly of the warhead was missing, and without it, the warhead was useless. Yet Roman urged everyone not to lose hope, as this kind of nuclear bomb was not easy to operate, and was different from handheld nuclear devices that could explode with the press of a button. Even if it was stolen by the vampire's transport team, they could only hide it, and not immediately use it. As long as they found the transport team, there was still a chance to recover the core assembly. On the other side, Ephraim made a new discovery. The group searched the vampire lair in a building and found the transport office of the partnership, run by human accomplices. The wall displayed vehicle schedules for Pennsylvania, involving all towns in the state. The desk held cargo manifests without specific content, but all shipments were large, with no fewer than 500 items. They knew the transport of blood was measured in gallons, so it was impossible to count by the piece. There was definitely something fishy going on. Ephraim wanted to understand the vampire's plan, so he brought the documents back to the high school for research. Alex's brother, however, believed the vampires wouldn't let them go and that a fierce battle would soon follow. His fears were quickly confirmed as several vehicles stopped outside the high school and a group of infected individuals got out. The person on surveillance duty sounded the alarm, but it was already too late. Faced with a large number of infected, members of the resistance organization lost their lives one by one. Even Alex's brother was not spared. She couldn't bear to kill her own family member, so Ephraim had to do it, then took Alex to escape the high school and hide in a nearby warehouse. The warehouse was located above a fashion company, with no infected roaming around and a wide field of view, allowing them to monitor the movement on the streets. During the time when the Vampire Master controlled humans, he would only order to attack illegal residents. But now, they were clearing entire buildings, clearly up to something. Alex found a bottle of liquor to drown her sorrows and tried to chat with Ephraim. To her surprise, Ephraim claimed to have stopped drinking just a few days earlier, and they started talking about the misdeeds of Ephraim's son, Zack. Fortunately, Alex didn't blame him and wanted to continue their journey of revenge together. When night fell, the two went to the building across the street and found a poster on the ground depicting a bright future. It was the same as the one in the transport office, but obviously fake. Over the past nine months, the Vampire Army had built a large number of infrastructure projects, but they hadn't spent time maintaining them. Considering their actions clearing the buildings, Ephraim speculated that the Vampire Master was raising a labor force, using fake advertisements to lure people out of the city. The question was, where would they nest after leaving the city? On the other side, Gus wanted to protect his cousin from being bullied by the other members. He taught his cousin how to use a handgun. However, as soon as he had finished the lesson, an urgent task arose. One of their men had gone out to deliver goods but was ambushed and severely injured by two of their own kind. He reported the incident before succumbing to his injuries and meeting Jesus. Gus vowed to avenge his fallen member. He and Cream believed the attackers must have had backup and wanted to find their hideout to deal with the entire group at once. They asked a few clients and obtained the criminal's descriptions. The main perpetrator was said to be a burly man with a gray beard. Gus and his cousin staked out the black market and eventually spotted the man. Gus sent his cousin back to report the news while he followed the gray-bearded man and discovered the location of their hideout, an old NYPD weapons depot. To his surprise, Gus recognized the group as former police officers who had patrolled his neighborhood before the eternal night fell. With the collapse of law and order, they had turned to a life of crime rather than becoming slaves to the vampires. Gus scouted the depot's defenses and discussed his findings with his men, aiming to devise an attack strategy. Cream wanted to make a bold entrance through the front door and annihilate their opponents with overwhelming firepower. 
but Gus advised him to abandon such heroic fantasies, pointing out the trained and heavily armed opponents would not be easily defeated, and they risked losing many members in the fight. Instead, he suggested attacking through the ventilation system to catch the former officers off guard. No one wanted to risk being a bullet sponge, so they agreed with Gus's plan. Armed with weapons, they infiltrated the ventilation system through the sewers and sent a sniper to deal with any stragglers outside. The ex-officers never expected an attack and fell into a disadvantageous position. In the ensuing hail of bullets, they were wiped out. During the fight, Gus's cousin killed someone for the first time, earning himself some recognition from Cream. Meanwhile, Sanjay and his wife were having dinner at a restaurant, but she refused to eat, showing him no respect. She disapproved of her husband's work for the Blood Master, especially targeting pregnant women. However, she didn't criticize him, knowing that without his protection, she would be reduced to a mere birthing machine in the vampire society. Sanjay was left to sulk alone when Thomas suddenly confronted him. He criticized Sanjay's inefficiency, noting that although the Blood Master had controlled humans for nine months, not a single baby had been born, and there was no plan for increasing the birth rate. Sanjay didn't dare argue with Thomas and promised to shorten the pregnancy duration, collecting babies as soon as they were viable. Upon returning to the medical center, Sanjay arranged for a cesarean section for a pregnant woman. He then asked Dutch to help calm the woman during the procedure. Dutch had been confined since her last escape attempt and was not allowed to move freely. Even so, she hesitated to help Sanjay. However, he threatened to send her away if she didn't cooperate, and knowing the outside world was much worse than the medical center, Dutch reluctantly agreed. Throughout the ordeal, Dutch tried to comfort the pregnant woman, but the doctor seemed indifferent. Dutch didn't dare discuss these matters with her, so she could only make small talk before the surgeries. She knew that once the babies of B-positive blood were born, they would be taken away to be raised somewhere else, and the mothers would never see their children. Helping the villains filled Dutch with guilt. Unable to bear the burden, Dutch went outside for fresh air, only to be scolded by another woman who accused her of being selfish and a pawn of Sanjay. Dutch wanted to explain, but no one believed her. She returned to the operating room disheartened to accompany the pregnant woman. The cesarean section surgery began. As soon as the baby was born, the woman wanted to see her child, but the doctor paid her no attention, driving her to an emotional breakdown. During the doctor's suturing, Dutch got into a conflict with a nurse and even kidnapped Sanjay, who had come to mediate. However, she didn't demand the baby from Sanjay. Instead, she forced him to open a door, then attacked him. As Sanjay was unable to retaliate, Dutch sprinted toward the exit. But when she reached the first floor, she discovered it was a massive blood factory. Inside cages were people with shaved heads, and hooks were lined with food awaiting blood extraction. The shocking scene left Dutch frozen in terror. Dutch was soon captured and imprisoned in a makeshift jail cell. Later, a guard comes in and tells her that someone is waiting for her outside. This person is Thomas, who previously tried to hurt her. Thomas doesn't hold a grudge for his severed hand and has even prepared a candle-lit dinner in gentlemanly fashion. Dutch wants to fight Thomas, but is no match for him, so they sit and talk instead. Thomas first praises the taste of Dutch's blood, then picks up a glass of blood from the table, admitting that it's still not as good as baby's blood. It turns out the newborn baby with B-positive blood type was not given to someone to raise, but was instead slaughtered for blood. Sanjay deceived Dutch, making her feel even more disgusted and frightened. She then asks Thomas to stop speaking in riddles and be straightforward. So Thomas demands that Dutch reveal Abraham's location or he will drain her blood. Dutch is worried about Abraham as well and informs Thomas that he's been captured, his fate unknown. This news unsettles Thomas, who quickly finds Sanjay, who's in charge of the partnership, and asks him to check the arrest records in the system. They soon learn that an old man with B-positive blood was captured the same day Dutch was caught and is now imprisoned in Research Facility 7, where bone marrow experiments are being conducted to extract as much blood as possible from the elderly. Thomas leaves Dutch under Sanjay's watch and heads to the research facility alone. At this moment, Abraham's body is filled with tubes and equipment is extracting his bone marrow. The process is extremely painful, so the doctor has administered a large dose of sedative. However, Thomas wants to forcibly wake Abraham and orders the doctor to inject him with amphetamine. This is a dangerous move, as the heart might not be able to handle the strain, causing sudden death. Under Thomas's threat, the doctor has no choice but to comply. Fortunately, Abraham only experiences brief hallucinations upon waking, seeing a venomous snake with a forked tongue. When he regains consciousness, he finds Thomas standing nearby. The two old rivals then engage in a war of words, but nothing more. 
Dutch's situation, however, isn't as good. She's taken to a room with wire mesh, where people are lining up to have their heads shaved. These people have been deceived, believing they're preparing for a vaccine against nuclear radiation. Dutch exposes the lies, takes down a guard, and incites a revolt. The building's alarm soon sounds, and Dutch takes advantage of the chaos to find Abraham. However, as she removes the tubes from Abraham, Thomas appears behind her, mocking her for her persistent resistance. Unexpectedly, Dutch ignited the medical alcohol and threw it at Thomas's feet. Flames instantly engulfed Thomas, and she hurriedly pushed Abraham and his bed away. At the same time, in Pennsylvania, Ephraim and Alex followed an advertisement to a local town. Their car broke down, so they had to stay in a small town. The town was eerily quiet with no signs of life, as if it had been cleansed by the vampires. The two picked up a phone from the ground and browsed through its videos while it still had battery. They found a video of a little girl who didn't want to go to New Horizon with her parents. New Horizon was the promised land advertised by the vampires. The girl planned to hide in a wardrobe on the day of departure and had prepared plenty of food to stave off hunger. Ephraim guessed the girl was still hiding at home, so they went to her house. However, after searching, they didn't find anyone, not even the girl's suitcase, which meant she had left with her parents after all. The two decided to rest there, but not long after lying down, they heard the sound of a door opening downstairs. They went to the door to check but found nothing unusual. However, a woman armed with a weapon appeared behind them. Seeing that Ephraim and Alex were not vampires, she lowered her weapon and began to talk. She had escaped from New Horizon and had recently been infected. She was in the process of transforming, but at Ephraim's urging, she agreed to take them to New Horizon to see the situation for themselves. The three of them walked through the snow, soon reaching a muddy path. The woman, fearing that she might startle their enemies, suggested taking a shortcut. Along the way, the woman complained about her impending death. Ephraim claimed he could help her avoid becoming a vampire, and she initially agreed. However, when they saw a pile of suitcases on the ground, she regretted her decision. Among the suitcases was a cartoon suitcase, which belonged to the girl from the video, which meant she had been killed too. The woman leading the way coughed uncontrollably and was about to complete her transformation. Ephraim prepared to shoot her, but couldn't do it after Alex's persuasion. They let the woman go, but she returned soon after, controlled by the vampire master. Her eyes were blood red as she spoke with Ephraim, claiming that his son Zack was still alive. However, before the vampire master could negotiate with Ephraim, Ephraim shot her without hesitation. He and Alex then continued on their journey. They then saw the full view of New Horizon from a hillside. It was not the paradise they had imagined. Instead, it was a row of tile-roofed houses for breeding livestock, showing that the defeated humans in the pandemic war lost their rights to coexist with vampires, and the vampire master deceived people into coming to this remote area where they were treated like livestock. Meanwhile, Fett had made progress on his end. Roman took him to several missile silos, but they were always one step behind, beaten by the vampire transport team that took away the necessary components. They decided to play bandits for once, but couldn't do it since the transport team had a powerful scout. The mercenaries hired by Fett didn't want to take the risk, but Charlotte falsely claimed that some valuable silverware was in the transport team's possession, and they would only take the missile components, leaving the silverware for the team. Faced with the prospect of huge profits, mercenaries agreed. After figuring out the transport team's route, Fett had Quinlan ambush them. Quinlan used his sword to destroy the tires of the leading vehicle. He then climbed onto the transport truck to subdue the scout inside. Fett and the others set up an ambush ahead, using an electric wire. The scout and Quinlan fought fiercely, but the scout was cut in half by the wire. At the same time, Quinlan subdued the truck driver. The mercenaries only emerged from the side at this point, and with a few shots, they wiped out the remaining vampires, obtaining the nuclear components. Fett, however, failed to give any silverware to the mercenaries, and so the group went their separate ways. Afterward, Fett reassembled the pool components back onto the nuclear warhead. Next, they had to transport it back to Manhattan as a generous gift for the Bloodmaster, but finding transportation was a headache. Fortunately, Roman had extensive connections and knew about a nearby Air Force base with six standby aircraft. Guarding the base was a guy who had served as a sergeant in a special forces unit. As long as they provided enough weapons and ammunition, they could definitely exchange them for an aircraft. At this time, Fett and Charlotte were showing affection for each other. Quinlan noticed and suddenly had a private chat with Fett, asking him to persuade Charlotte to stay in North Dakota and not to take risks on the front line. 
It wasn't that Quinlan didn't believe in Charlotte's capabilities, but he had learned from his past experiences. In 1888, Quinlan tracked the Bloodmaster to London. He had dealings with the local opium den's madam. One night, a well-dressed woman visited the madam, asking if she had found the immortal man, which was actually Quinlan. In order to investigate the motives behind the woman, he had been following without revealing himself. Unexpectedly on the way back, the woman was harassed by some thugs. Quinlan helped her out and killed two people in front of her. He was interested in the blood on her hand, but he never impulsively hunted for food. Instead, he asked her why she was looking for him. They sat for a detailed discussion. Quinlan learned that the woman's name was Louisa. Her brother had studied dark magic and knew that immortal vampires existed in the world. When he was gravely ill and on the verge of death, he asked Louisa to find a vampire in the hope of escaping illness and achieving immortality. To convince Quinlan, Louisa exposed her greasy neck, intending to use her blood as a trade with Quinlan. Quinlan didn't agree. Moreover, he didn't have bloodworms in his body, so all curses were only effective on himself. At Louisa's request, he agreed to visit her sick brother and satisfy the brother's obsession with black magic. He later advised Louisa to let go, but she refused. She couldn't bear to see her loved ones leave. At that time, Quinlan hadn't discovered the Bloodmaster's whereabouts and was still interested in human nature. So he stayed at Louisa's house and chatted with her. They then developed feelings for each other. Although Louisa had been married and had a lively daughter, she was open-minded and bold. She accepted Quinlan's identity and asked him to satisfy her once. The lover struck Quinlan agreed and was dressed as an English gentleman. He then climbed into Louisa's bed and engaged in some intimate exercise. Quinlan had been alive for nearly 2,000 years and had never been accepted by anyone like this. So he stayed by Louisa's side, accompanied her through her brother's death, attended the family funeral, and took care of the young child. Occasionally, he would accompany Louisa shopping and go to the theater to watch plays. Quinlan had to wear sunglasses whenever he went out. But as their love deepened, Quinlan met an infected hunter on the street and knew that the Bloodmaster had come to London. Despite Louisa's objections, he decided to face his mission and deal with the Bloodmaster to prevent the spread of the plague. He did this for himself and for Louisa and her daughter. However, when he found the Bloodmaster's lair, he discovered that everyone in the opium den had already been attacked. No one had been spared. The Bloodmaster wasn't afraid of Quinlan. During the battle, the Bloodmaster realized that brute force wouldn't bring victory. The Bloodmaster had to feign weakness and look for a chance. When it was time for Quinlan to deliver the final blow, he hesitated. He couldn't let go of Louisa. The death of the Bloodmaster meant that he too would vanish into thin air. The Bloodmaster seized the opportunity, attacked with a sword, and pinned Quinlan to a pillar. But he didn't kill him. Because of his penchant for inflicting pain on others, the Bloodmaster turned his attention to Louisa and her daughter. By the time Quinlan arrived, the two had already had their blood drained by the Bloodmaster. Dressed in their nightgowns, they lay in bed, looking very peaceful, but already showing signs of mutation. Quinlan sighed deeply, then wiped the makeup off his face. Without Louisa, he was no longer the London gentleman, but returned to the freak rejected by society. He then raised his sword and beheaded Louisa and her daughter. Although Quinlan didn't tell Fett about this experience, Fett understood his intentions. So he sought a private conversation with Charlotte, allowing her to make her own choice. Charlotte did not want to put Fett in a difficult position. Therefore, she decided to stay in North Dakota and wait for Fett to return after his mission was accomplished, so they could continue to show their love for each other. At this time, Zack also fell in love and busied himself by Abby's side. The two shared stories about their past lives and leisurely strolled through the streets where the anti-epidemic posters were thrown on the ground, trampled by people. Zack was still blaming Ephraim for his mother's death, admitting he might be a freak. Abby could only apologize and agree, saying they were both freaks and shouldn't despise each other. When it was time to part ways, Zack, as always, gave Abby fresh fruit as a gift. But he couldn't suppress his emotional impulses and was reluctant to leave easily. Abby nervously gave Zack a peck on the cheek, causing his heart to bloom. When he was taking the white blood, the Bloodmaster saw through his thoughts. He advised Zack not to hold hope for human nature and ask Abby for her thoughts. To do so would be tantamount to confessing his feelings. Zack was confident that they were mutually in love, so he prepared for his confession day and sat in the house, waiting for Abby to come. 
However, after waiting for a long time without seeing Abby, he couldn't help himself and went to find her residence. To his surprise, he found Abby distributing the fruit he had given her and being overly intimate with a young man. He felt deceived and returned to the hotel in silence. When Abby came to work as if nothing had happened, Zack exposed the fact that she had a boyfriend. Abby had nothing to hide, claiming that she had always seen him as a male confidant and never thought of their relationship as romantic. Even if they were to date, Zack's age was too young and not within her selection criteria. This remark stung Zack, making him angry and smashing plates. Abby tendered her resignation again and prepared to leave. Zack tried to retain her, but to no avail. His pet scout couldn't stand it any longer and ended Abby's life on the spot. A life disappeared before his eyes, but Zack remained indifferent. Afterward, when the Bloodmaster appeared as Kelly to comfort Zack and took the opportunity to slander his father Ephraim, Zack thought he had given enough, but in return, he was deceived. The Bloodmaster told Zack not to be sad, as Abby didn't die, but instead stayed by his side. Then, the mutated Abby walked in with food. Zack hugged Kelly and expressed his gratitude to this mother figure. In fact, Zack had already become one of those who commit evil deeds, and his thinking had gone beyond the realm of reason. On the other side, Fett and the others were on their way to the airport. He cherished his final moments with Charlotte as they sat in the back seat, whispering to each other. Suddenly, a sound came from the radio. It was a civilian radio frequency, indicating someone nearby had turned on a radio. At first, they didn't pay much attention until they heard Thomas's voice coming from it. It turns out, after Fett had stolen the nuclear warhead, the Bloodmaster had learned about the battle and sent Thomas to intercept it in North Dakota. Thomas hadn't been killed in the fire. His face was just burned, and he had some minor skin injuries. After dealing with Fett's former mercenaries, he forced them to take him to the Air Force base. The leader of the mercenaries reluctantly agreed to be Thomas's human helper. However, Thomas constantly mocked the leader for being cowardly and not having the spirit of a hero. This angered the leader, so he secretly turned on the radio to inform Fett. When Thomas noticed the anomaly, Charlotte had already guided the group to take a shortcut to the airport. Meanwhile, the leader intentionally slowed down. Thomas then asked him to stop the car, but instead he sped up and jumped out of the car to escape. But he couldn't escape Thomas's grasp and lost his life. At that moment, Fett and his group finally reached the airport. There were no infected individuals around. The only threat was a sergeant holding a sniper rifle, aiming at the newcomers. After some communication between him and the group, the sergeant opened the gate and agreed to exchange firearms for the airplane. While preparing for takeoff, Fett bid farewell to Charlotte and urged her to leave before Thomas arrived. Although reluctant, Charlotte rode away on a motorcycle. Shortly after, the group boarded the airplane, and once they confirmed the cargo was safe, they prepared for takeoff. However, Thomas arrived in a car, hot on their heels. Just as he was about to attack the airplane, a soldier who had been observing the situation rushed to help. He fired two shots, blowing out the tires of Thomas's car. Despite hiding in the shadows, the soldier still met his end from Thomas's frenzied gunfire. Thomas then fired at the airplane, but someone shot him down from the car with a precise arrow. It was Charlotte who had returned. The plane finally took off smoothly, and as planned, Fett and his team transported the nuclear warhead back to New York. However, they were intercepted by a large number of vampires upon landing. The vampires had not set up an ambush and chose to confront Fett's group head-on. As expected, the vampires were wiped out, leaving behind two cars and a truck full of weapons. The Bloodmaster was wary of the nuclear weapon, especially since it had previously been used to eliminate three of the vampire ancestors. When Thomas returned empty-handed and sought forgiveness, the Bloodmaster became agitated and vented his anger on his loyal servant. Thomas realized his master had lost confidence in him, and he felt guilty for his failure. He knelt down and offered to die as an apology. The Bloodmaster did not agree as he still needed Thomas's sacrifice. Instead, he challenged Thomas's pride, suggesting that if Thomas were to terminate himself at this moment, it would be tantamount to admitting defeat to Abraham, who would be overjoyed by such a victory. With renewed confidence, Thomas vowed to find Abraham's team and figure out a way to prevent the nuclear warhead from reaching Manhattan. Thomas then found the businessman Sanjay, praised his recent work, and decided to promote him. 
Sanjay was tasked with issuing a warrant for the arrest of Abraham's team and intercepting Fett to prevent the nuclear warhead from crossing the river. After all, the Bloodmaster's main base was on the other side of the river. Meanwhile, Abraham had changed into new clothes and reclaimed the Sardu's silver sword. He seemed to be his usual energetic self, like the pawn shop owner from before. However, he confided in Dutch, saying that when faced with an enemy like time, one cannot escape but only feel betrayed by their own body. This statement was soon proven true when the two of them went to retrieve the ancient book. Abraham suddenly found himself short of breath and struggled to climb the stairs. His hands, gripping the sword, were no longer steady. When Dutch brought the ancient book to him, Abraham's primary concern was whether the book had remained unharmed. Afterward, the two hid from the Bloodmaster's pursuit in a Manhattan monastery. Abraham became agitated, and his actions became somewhat irrational. He tore the pages of the book one by one and pasted them on the walls. Dutch was puzzled and asked him why. He explained that he had a dream in which the illustrations in the book represented eternity and destruction. He needed to see those images simultaneously to discover patterns he had previously overlooked. Dutch thought he was being impulsive and asked if his previous ideas about the face of God were wrong. She tried to calm him down, but he reacted strongly, saying he didn't have much time left. Suddenly he felt dizzy and fainted. Dutch was terrified. While she was at a loss, she heard a noise outside and went to investigate. She found Ephraim and Alex. It turned out that after learning that his son Zack was still alive, Ephraim returned to New York to find Abraham and try to kill the Bloodmaster to end it all. To his surprise, Abraham had collapsed. Ephraim examined him and discovered he had an irregular heartbeat. Ephraim wanted to prescribe medicine for Abraham's condition, but didn't know what had happened to him. Dutch couldn't explain either, as she had been separated from Abraham for three months after being arrested. But obviously, it was due to Thomas injecting him with amphetamine previously, a central nervous system stimulant. Ephraim had no equipment to perform surgery on Abraham, so he could only give him some blood anticoagulants. Since medicines were now strictly controlled, they were difficult to obtain. The only place to buy them was the black market. Dutch and Ephraim had to find Gus, whose pharmacy had an abundant stock of not only anticoagulants, but also saline solution. However, when they got the medicine, Gus insisted that Ephraim follow the black market rule of bartering. Ephraim had nothing to trade, and Abraham's silverware had been lost. There was no way he could give up the silver cane. Seeing that, Gus stepped in as a friend and generously offered the medicine out of his respect for Abraham. Although Cream was reluctant to agree, he had to agree due to Gus's domineering attitude. Afterward, Gus returned with Ephraim to check on Abraham's condition. On the way, they encountered a patrol car with wanted posters of the team members. The three had to take a detour to avoid exposure and return to the monastery. However, they were still tracked by Cream. Abraham looked down on this kind of businessman and scolded Gus for being associated with him. Gus said he just wanted to survive, but Abraham's words struck a chord. If they continued like this, the world would eventually fall into the Bloodmaster's hands. So Gus went back and started preparing weapons with his cousin to fight the Bloodmaster. Abraham was happy that Ephraim had returned to the team. After exchanging information, Abraham learned about the Bloodmaster's plot to breed humans, a tactic used by the Nazis in their concentration camps. It seemed that the Bloodmaster had learned from humans, and humans themselves were the root of all evil. Ephraim didn't elaborate further, worrying about Abraham's health. He told him that he could only take one blood anticoagulant pill per day. Taking more would cause internal bleeding. Ephraim had used this mechanism to kill thousands of infected people in Philadelphia. Abraham followed his advice but told Ephraim that he needed white blood. He then gave Ephraim the formula and asked him to help extract the magic substance from the bloodworms. Ephraim thought it was unrealistic, but under Abraham's insistence, he decided to give it a try. While they searched everywhere for the extraction equipment, Cream went to Sanjay and proposed a meeting with the Bloodmaster to discuss cooperation. Sanjay, who wanted to find Abraham, agreed to Cream's proposal. Cream made his intentions clear when he met the Bloodmaster. He knew the location of Abraham's team's hideout and wanted to exchange the information for control over Roosevelt Island and the entire black market. He took out a bomb and held it in his hand, saying he didn't mind going down with the Bloodmaster if he tried to turn him, but his actions were child's play in the eyes of the Bloodmaster, who teleported the bomb away and dismantled it before draining cream in his despair. Sanjay watched the scene in astonishment. 
Meanwhile, Ephraim found the extraction equipment in a hidden drug lab. He changed Abraham's medication and asked Alex to help take care of him while he went out with Dutch to look for bloodworms. But before leaving, Ephraim couldn't resist the guilt and revealed the truth about his son, Zach, detonating the nuclear bomb. If it weren't for that brat, Abraham would have stopped the epidemic long ago, and he wouldn't be bedridden now, still desperately searching for the blood master. Abraham didn't blame Ephraim and encouraged him not to lose confidence because of this. At the same time, Fett and his team disguised themselves as employees of the partnership and sneaked into the city. But due to the wanted list, their true identities were discovered by the guards, and Fett had no choice but to break through. After preparing weapons at night, they planned to enter Manhattan from the Brooklyn Bridge. Little did they know that Sanjay's swift actions had blown up all the bridges and tunnels leading to Manhattan, something Fett hadn't anticipated. The Bloodmaster turned the transformed cream into a high-level infected and sent him with Thomas to capture Abraham, because now only Abraham and Alex were left behind at the monastery, both of whom were rookies with little combat power. Alex was killed by Vampire Cream in an instant, and Abraham tried to fight Thomas but was too weak. He didn't even have the strength to insult Thomas using words and was beaten bloody by him. Thomas and the Bloodmaster had always been bitter about God, and every time they saw Abraham, they would ask him where his God was, trying to make him abandon his faith. Thomas even called Abraham by his concentration camp number, tormenting him even more. But before they could talk for long, gunshots suddenly rang out from behind. It turned out that Gus and his cousin had arrived. They rescued Abraham and didn't stay put, but continued to pursue the fleeing Thomas and Cream. However, the cousin was killed by a surprise attack from Thomas, and Gus was subdued by Cream. Just as Gus was about to become food for Thomas, Abraham suddenly appeared behind him and stabbed Thomas with a sword. However, he didn't hit a vital spot, and the ordinary silverware did little damage to Thomas. Despite having a hole in his abdomen, he still had the strength to lift Abraham up like an adult toy. Abraham infuriated Thomas even more. Thomas asked if he wanted to continue talking or kill him. Thomas then drained Abraham's blood, not knowing that this was exactly what Abraham wanted. It turned out that he had swallowed all the blood anticoagulants and used himself as bait to poison Thomas. Arrogant and self-absorbed, Thomas fell to the ground as the poison took effect. Gus seized the opportunity to kill Cream. Abraham picked up a silver sword from the ground and unleashed his anger on the Bloodmaster, calling him a mere parasite that would eventually be killed by humans. The Bloodmaster was furious. Abraham then told Thomas that his name was Abraham Satrakian, not the number from the concentration camp. He then uttered some words and swung his sword, decapitating Thomas and sending the evil Nazi to hell. When Ephraim and Dutch return, they find a headless corpse in the monastery. When they locate the severed head nearby, they're sure that Thomas is poisoned and dead. Gus briefly explains the situation to the two, but dares not mention Abraham. Instead, he leads them to see him. At this moment, Abraham is writing furiously, his face covered in blood. His life is nearing its end. Even if he doesn't die from internal bleeding, he'll soon transform into a member of the vampire race. He hates these creatures and doesn't want to become a puppet of the Bloodmaster, so he decides to write down everything in his mind during his final moments. Meanwhile, Fett is diligently transporting a nuclear bomb. They've stolen a ship from the partnership, disguised themselves as employees, and sailed into Manhattan. This time, Roman goes to handle the negotiations. As Roman distracts the guards, Quinlan swiftly takes them out. They then obtain a vehicle from the vampires and transport the nuclear bomb to a safe location. Naturally, the destination isn't the monastery as it's too dangerous. They can only go to the Federal Bank's New York branch. Fett knew the bank's structure well, as it was initially designed for storage. However, they can't store the bomb alone, it needs a companion. So Roman stays behind to guard it. Being unfamiliar with the area, Roman is hesitant at first, fearing abandonment. But Fett promises to contact him soon, and, wanting to prove his strength, Roman accepts the assigned task. Fett and Quinlan head to the monastery without rest, intending to surprise Abraham with their successful return. When they arrive, they are horrified to see Abraham standing in the center of the crowd, his face still stained with blood and blood worms visibly wriggling beneath his skin. He's already finished writing everything and sits down to deliver his last words. He had thought the ancient book contained a foolproof method to eliminate the Bloodmaster, but later realized he was wrong. To truly defeat the Bloodmaster, they must separate him from his collaborators and first eliminate the humans who have selfishly sided with him. 
This will significantly weaken his power, creating the opportunity for a lethal strike, though it will cost them their lives. Everyone is left confused by his words, but Abraham has no time to explain. He hands his manuscript to Fett, urging him not to let his research go to waste. He then passes a silver sword to Quinlan. Already hearing hallucinations in his head and knowing he'll soon transform, he wishes for Quinlan to end his life. Quinlan draws the silver sword, touching Abraham's shoulder, as if bestowing a knighthood upon the lifelong warrior. The sword then descends, piercing Abraham's heart. Amidst everyone's grief, he passes away on the eve of their victory. His body was buried on the spot, ultimately becoming a wandering soul in a foreign land. Quinlan had witnessed countless lives and deaths, but was still moved by Abraham's sacrifice. He bid farewell at the grave and handed the silver sword to Fett, designating the inheritance of Abraham's legacy. After the simple funeral, everyone composed themselves and discussed the meaning of Abraham's last words. But none of them had studied the ancient book, so they couldn't understand what Abraham was trying to say. Quinlan thought Abraham was talking nonsense, and they should proceed with the original plan of using a nuclear bomb against the Bloodmaster. However, Ephraim disagreed, arguing that there was no need to use the wide-ranging damage of a nuclear bomb since Abraham had thought of a new method. The two had different opinions and argued with each other. Gus gathered Cream's men, asking those willing to stay and join forces to fight the Bloodmaster. He managed to gather quite a few followers. At the same time, Dutch was fed up with Ephraim and Quinlan's dispute, asking them that if they both wanted to kill the Bloodmaster, why not first find his hiding place, which was the most crucial issue. Dutch suggested they look for Sanjay, a businessman always running errands and involved with the Bloodmaster. Thus, the operation to capture Sanjay and dismantle the Blood Factory began. Everyone picked weapons from Gus's warehouse and pretended to be captured prisoners. Quinlan escorted them to the partnership's medical center, claiming they were to deliver the pure blood. The guard didn't dare to delay, and seeing Quinlan resembling a bloodsucker, opened the gate without inspection. The group entered the medical building, dressed as employees with armbands on their shoulders. Fett, Ephraim, and Dutch took the elevator in the warehouse, while Quinlan and Gus led others to the blood factory. The guard became suspicious and called Sanjay to report a suspicious vehicle entering the building. Sanjay hadn't reacted yet, and checking the surveillance didn't clarify the situation. However, he knew something was wrong and ordered the building to be locked down. Little did he know, Ephraim was faster, knocking out the guard and opening all the doors. Fett and Dutch proceeded unobstructed, heading straight for Sanjay's office, where they battled the guards. The battle at the blood factory began. Quinlan and Gus killed the infected there, causing the death of a large explorer child. They rescued all the living people in cages. During the chaos, Sanjay kidnapped three pregnant women and hid in a small room, using them as hostages to threaten Dutch not to act recklessly. By then, the alarm in the building had been triggered, and a large number of infected were on their way. Fett and Dutch had no time to waste, so they disregarded the hostages' safety and stormed the room. However, as Sanjay aimed his gun at the pregnant women, a nearby guard couldn't bear it, turned against Sanjay and let the hostages go. Sanjay tried to escape, but encountered Ephraim. He had no choice but to run towards the blood factory, with Dutch and others chasing him. After several twists and turns, they captured him and brought him back to Gus's warehouse, which was the old police armory. While everyone waited for Sanjay to regain consciousness, the Bloodmaster made a move. Later, someone claimed to have seen a boy in the black market who was looking for Ephraim. The boy was actually Zack, sent by the Bloodmaster. Dutch advised Ephraim not to be impulsive, saying that Zack's appearance was suspicious. However, Ephraim rushed to the black market to meet his son. Zack returned to Ephraim's side. Ephraim should have been happy, but he was disappointed in his son and didn't trust him, thinking he was there to provide false military information. However, he still gave his son a chance to change his ways. Everyone else was also on high alert, so they blindfolded Zack and took him back to the old armory, locking him in a room. Zack didn't resist and behaved obediently, like a well-behaved child. He fell asleep as soon as the blanket covered him. Ephraim wanted to question his son about his experiences, but had to wait for him to wake up. Meanwhile, the interrogation of Sanjay was underway. Fett asked if Sanjay felt guilty watching truckloads of innocent people being sent for blood extraction every day. But Sanjay had his own reasoning. He was indeed afraid of the blood factory's assembly line, but his actions promoted peaceful coexistence between humans and the vampire strain and helped more people find work in the partnership. Dutch was shocked by Sanjay's reasoning. 
Even if the previous world was terrible, people wouldn't be hung on hooks to have their blood drawn, nor would they collect newborn babies. Dutch got infuriated, and she beat Sanjay down. However, they couldn't kill him, as finding the Bloodmaster's lair was the top priority. In the second interrogation, Fett showed the video that Ephraim had taken in Pennsylvania. The footage depicted groups of living people confined in a farm, where the vampires treated them like livestock. Surprisingly, Sanjay did not believe it, claiming that he had met the people at the farm and that they were all farmers working in the fields. He argued that since people living in groups were prone to illness and the vampires needed human blood, it wouldn't make sense for them to let their food source get sick. It's no wonder Sanjay had these ideas, as he had never seen how humans were treated in the modern concentration camps. However, he claimed that Dutch had fabricated the video because she was a computer expert. Dutch was frustrated by this accusation, but knew that beating him would be useless, so she let Quinlan handle it. Quinlan then cut the rope binding Sanjay's hands without a word and dragged him to another room. It turned out that Quinlan had captured Sanjay's wife. If Sanjay did not cooperate, he would drain his wife's blood in front of him. Sanjay wanted to remain stubborn, but he was terrified of the strain's tendril. Seeing Quinlan spit out the tendril, he immediately confessed that the Bloodmaster was hiding in the Empire State Building. He even drew a floor plan. At this time, Zack woke up from his sleep, and Ephraim came to ask about his situation. Standing at the door, Ephraim looked very serious. Zack dared not look at his father, bowing his head and speaking in an aggrieved tone. He said that after the nuclear explosion, he was so panicked that he ran out of the Stoneheart group building and encountered Thomas, who brought him to the Bloodmaster. There, he had video games to play and even got to handle real guns. However, he had to endure the Bloodmaster's brainwashing and even kill a tiger by himself. Now, Zack portrayed himself as a victim. He did not mention letting the vampire scout kill the servant girl, Abby. He was very respectful to Ephraim, admitting that he was wrong and should not have treated the parasite as his mother. Ephraim felt guilty for not being there to educate his son properly. He then asked Zack how he escaped, and Zack told the truth that the Bloodmaster set him free to return to Ephraim's side and find the location of the nuclear bomb. He was taken out for questioning, asked to reveal the Bloodmaster's lair and draw a corresponding floor plan. Unexpectedly, the information matched that of Sanjay. Quinlan remained cautious, considering that spies often provided a mix of true and false information to gain trust. To be safe, they locked up Zack again, but they still had to visit the Empire State Building, hoping to catch the Bloodmaster. However, they needed a plan. After some thought, everyone decided to send Gus and his men to help Roman and protect the nuclear bomb together. However, Fett did not notify Roman in advance, so when they saw a large number of armed men breaking in, they were confused, thinking that these people were up to no good. Roman even considered mutual destruction, but fortunately, Gus described Fett's features to gain his trust. At the same time, they brought a lot of weapons, which impressed Roman. He then took Gus to see the nuclear bomb, explaining that its range could be adjusted. At its smallest, it could destroy a single building, while at its largest, it could devastate half of Manhattan. Gus and his brothers decided to prepare for the battle by moving all the silver bars from the vault. Meanwhile, Roman busied himself with programming the detonation sequence. One night, Ephraim took his son out for some fresh air and apologized for interrogating him earlier. He gave the boy a can of soda and Zack couldn't hide his emotions. He expressed regret for setting off the nuclear bomb. However, after the father and son embraced, Zack accidentally cut his hand while opening the soda. A drop of blood fell on the rooftop, and Ephraim quickly took him back inside. Ephraim couldn't figure out why this had happened, since Zack had never cut his hand while opening a soda in all these years, yet it happened now at such a crucial moment. It seemed deliberate. Ephraim didn't help Zack with the wound, but instead accused him of trying to mark their location with the scent of blood so that the Bloodmaster could track them down. At first, Zack tried to argue, but seeing Ephraim's growing rage, he stopped pretending. He came clean and with a defiant expression berated Ephraim for killing his mother. He even urged Ephraim to surrender now. Furious, Ephraim wanted to shoot Zack but couldn't bring himself to do it. Instead, he locked him up and notified Fett and his people to pack up and leave as soon as possible. Fett and Quinlan's plan was only halfway discussed when they had to move their base to the Federal Reserve to join forces with Gus's people. They worried that the Bloodmaster had set an ambush in the Empire State Building, and entering it would mean their complete annihilation. 
So Quinlan decided to go and investigate first. If he confirmed that the Bloodmaster was inside, he would use a radio to contact Fett and have him bring the nuclear bomb to the building's base. If Quinlan could face the Bloodmaster, he would trigger the detonator made by Roman. Having made up their minds, the group set off immediately. However, they were too late. After receiving Zack's signal, the Bloodmaster led his men to the old armory. But he was disappointed that Zack hadn't gotten any information about the nuclear bomb's whereabouts. When he learned that Ephraim and his team were heading to the Empire State Building, he grew tired of the situation. Ever since his loyal servant Thomas had sacrificed himself, the Bloodmaster had been surrounded by incompetence. He had to handle everything himself, and now he had a traitor in his ranks. He then went on to rescue the trapped Sanjay. Seeing the situation, Zack immediately pointed him out, claiming that it was Sanjay who had leaked the secret. Sanjay was filled with panic, and he hurriedly blamed his wife to save himself. The Bloodmaster's rage soared. He snapped the wife's neck and also killed the cunning Sanjay because he couldn't tolerate lying humans. Quinlan, on the other hand, was entering the building alone, ready for anything. When he reached the top floor, all he found was some soil infested with bloodworms and the vampire Abbey. The Bloodmaster's coffin had already been moved to somewhere else. Quinlan quickly informed Fett and told him to retreat. The Bloodmaster, seeing everything through Abby, wasn't in a hurry. He exchanged taunts with Quinlan from afar, rather than hormones. Quinlan grew impatient as infected people closed in behind him. He decisively drew his sword and fought the enemy while infected individuals started appearing on the streets, their numbers quite intimidating. Gus told Fett and Dutch to leave while he and his men held off the enemy. They had prepared weapons in advance, and some even sacrificed themselves as suicide bombers. They quickly achieved victory, but the Bloodmaster refused to back down. He incited every infected person in the city to go on a rampage, searching house by house for Fett and his group. New York was filled with screams and wailing, with bloodsuckers hunting above and below ground. To avoid being captured, Gus had no choice but to hide in a room and reluctantly terminated his infected man. Fett had planned an escape route. He drove to the construction site of a water channel, where Quinlan followed the scent and managed to escape. They then transported the nuclear bomb into an elevator, which took it 200 meters underground for storage. This place used to be an aqueduct that brought water from the reservoir into New York City. Workers had been digging for 50 years, but the project was halted due to the invasion of the bloodsuckers. Quinlan was amazed that humans could construct such a massive tunnel and couldn't help but think of the three vampire ancestors' shabby lair. When Thomas had detonated the nuclear bomb, the explosion destroyed the ancestors but didn't affect New York City. This indicated that if they could detonate the nuclear bomb inside the tunnel, it shouldn't greatly impact the city. Quinlan didn't care if New York survived or perished. His sole focus was to hunt down the Bloodmaster. However, Fett and the others wanted to defeat the Bloodmaster while saving New York. So Quinlan devised a new plan, asking Fett if he was willing to make the sacrifice. If he was, then he could join the Suicide Squad. This might be the self-sacrifice that Abraham had mentioned in his last words. Now the plan was simple. Lure the Bloodmaster into the tunnel, have Quinlan hold him back, and then have Fett detonate the nuclear bomb. The detonator signal couldn't penetrate 200 meters of bedrock, meaning Fett had to be sent to activate it underground, and Fett would be killed by the blast. Dutch couldn't accept this arrangement. However, she couldn't convince them, nor did she have any reason to persuade someone to give up. Fett was determined, and in order to secure a victory, he rigged the elevator cables with the bomb. Once Quinlan engaged the Bloodmaster in the main elevator, Fett would descend in the auxiliary elevator, simultaneously destroying the cables to prevent the Bloodmaster from escaping. However, this would also cut off Quinlan's own escape route. So he asked Dutch to clean up the aftermath, eliminating the remaining infected individuals after the Bloodmaster's death. Dutch could only ask Ephraim for help, hoping he could change Fett's mind. At that moment, Gus returned with Roman, informing everyone that the infected had gone berserk and were only 30 blocks away. If they were going to act, they had to do so quickly. Ephraim came up with a plan to walk with Fett the next day, seemingly patrolling the area but actually serving as bait to lure the Bloodmaster. Along the way, Ephraim mentioned Dutch's request. Fett had too many regrets, so he decided to share his last words with Ephraim. As soon as they were spotted by a sentry, they promptly turned back. After discovering their whereabouts, the Bloodmaster decided to confront the problem head-on, especially Quinlan, whom he felt a sense of destiny with. He arrogantly led a few hundred followers into the water channel. Predictably, they were met with heavy firepower as soon as they entered. 
At a critical moment, the Bloodmaster's howl disrupted the battle, causing Ephraim and his team to be temporarily immobilized by the loud sound. Fortunately, Quinlan was unaffected and charged at the Bloodmaster, leading him into the main elevator. Zack joined the fight following the Bloodmaster, but he was also knocked unconscious during the chaos. When Fett and Dutch arrived to close the elevator doors, Zack was still lying inside. Ephraim hurriedly descended using the auxiliary elevator, intending to carry out the explosion mission in place of Fett. Soon, Zack finally regained consciousness. By then, the Bloodmaster and Quinlan had already exchanged several rounds of combat. Quinlan chose to fight barehanded. He was no match for the Bloodmaster, but still managed to counterattack, almost twisting his opponent's neck. Unfortunately, he only managed to break the skin, which was a minor injury for the Bloodmaster. Subsequently, the Bloodmaster trampled Quinlan to death, but his body was on the verge of collapse. He then tried to possess Zack, but was thwarted by Ephraim, who had just arrived. Frustrated, the Bloodmaster ordered Zack to kill Ephraim, but the reluctant boy couldn't bring himself to do so. Instead, he turned the gun on the Bloodmaster, but failed to hit a vital spot. Realizing this, the Bloodmaster started the possession process. In a desperate move, Ephraim charged at the Bloodmaster, toppling him, but taking the brunt of the possession in Zack's stead. Meanwhile, the infected outside became sluggish, allowing Fett and Dutch to break free from the battlefield. Inside the tunnel, the blood worms gradually took over Ephraim's consciousness, turning him from Zack's father into the Bloodmaster's new vessel. However, the newly conscious Bloodmaster was not fully recovered and engaged in fatherly affection with Zack. Unbeknownst to him, Zack activated the detonator while the Bloodmaster was preoccupied with his emotions. The resulting explosion caused massive ground tremors, finally killing the Bloodmaster for good. Ephraim and Zack both perished in the blast, bringing an end to the year-long vampire plague. Without the Bloodmaster's control, the survivors easily dealt with the remaining infected. Five years later, the Earth's ecosystem had improved, and sunlight returned to the planet. The drama of Season 4 ends with Roman becoming the biggest real estate agent in Manhattan, while Gus moved to the countryside, hoping to one day reunite with his crush. Fett, having forgotten about Charlotte in North Dakota, resumed his role as a pest control expert in New York and began dating Dutch. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.